So hi Taran, Taran Singh, uh, hi. So welcome to the TLDR, too long, didn't read. Um, a way to look concisely at um, innovative business. So Taran, could you just give us the name of the, the business and uh, where you're joining us from today? Yeah, the name of the business is Taran 3D Limited and I'm joining you from Birmingham, uh, Hansworth Wood in particular in Birmingham. In, in, in the UK? Uh -huh. In the UK, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. And we no, no, and we just spoke that maybe we have similar accents, but we come. I'm from a region like the Black Country, and uh, Birmingham is the biggest city nearby. Yeah. So, uh, Taran, how long um, um, has Taran? It's it's your name you gave the company. Is, how, yeah, did, yeah. how did that come about? Um, well, I've been working in 3D kind of design for the last sort of 15 years, and. Kind of everyone knew, knew me as Taran the 3D guy. So everyone would say, oh, do you know Taran the 3D guy? It was, it was never just Taran, it was Taran the 3D guy. And it kind of just stuck as a sort of business. Everyone just knew Taran the 3D guy. So I just named the business Taran 3D. It was just the easiest, yeah. <laughs> laziest kind of name I could come up with. And it yeah. just kind of, kind of everyone still recognized it, if you see what I mean. Yes, yes. And mm. uh, so I have five points that I'd like to touch on for... Um, yeah something of an executive summary about the the, the business uh, as it stands um, so what's the what are the positive aspects of uh, what you're doing you know maybe personally and business wise what are the positive aspects of Taran 3d um I would say some of the positive aspects is I get to kind of choose some of the projects that I work on which is kind of nice it gives you a bit of autonomy and I also really, I think one of the other big positive is um, being able to be creative. So it's quite a creative uh, craft. And so I'm always exploring and always learning and always looking for more interesting projects. So yeah, those are two big positives for me, really. And one thing that's very curious uh, for me is um, you're the expert, you're the 3D expert, uh, which means technically you have maintained uh, a good level of proficiency in lots yeah. of software. Um, do you work in a team? Because as a company, you're going to be overloaded occasionally with clients. Uh, yes, yes. So we've we've had that uh, pretty much the last since since COVID hit. Obviously, the need for virtualization and you know virtual sort of three D assets has increased. So we did actually increase our team. So we're a team of about five people and we're going to be increasing to seven people within by next month. Wow. Um, taking advantage of the government kickstart scheme, which is to give young people more opportunities uh, with innovative businesses. Um, so yeah, we do work as part of a team. And uh, the problem that we've had is that there's not many people out there who've got the necessary skills that we're wow. looking for. So we have our own sort of internal training sort of um, kind of uh, program mm. and it's kind of been quite successful. So we're actually rolling it out and offering it to other businesses. Mm. Um, so, so you say, in fact, when I look on your LinkedIn, um, there's three elements. Uh, how, how big is your dog? <laughs> Um, actually, the next door neighbor's dog is oh, outside. Right. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's looking oh, after yeah. the, the territory for a while. Um, so... It's consultancy training and visualization. Or That's correct. Yeah, those are the three areas that we cover. And the training has more come out of the kind of like we didn't set out to do training. Uh, we were doing uh, 3D visualization services and we were doing consultancy for VR and AR because everyone's interested in it. Yeah. Um, but the, what we realized was that there's actually a big sort of demand for training and skills okay. um, transfer. So we were able to sort of um, kind of plug that gap quite easily and it became kind of just kind of a, um, became sort of a business interest for us because we saw the demand for it. So, yeah, we didn't. It wasn't planned. It was something that we we kind of learned along the way and emerged as another part of the business. So uh, proportionally, uh, how much uh, like percentage wise, how much could you divide uh, in a pie chart like uh, yeah. between consultancy um actual visualization and um, training? Yeah, so I would say it would be 25% uh, consultancy, 25% uh, training, and then it would be 50% 3D visualization. Okay. Uh, but I, I, what we're seeing is in the future, actually, um, I think 
um, it's going to be 25% uh, consultancy and then it will be 50-50 between visualization and training. So the training side of things is really kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a massive uptake in, you know, uh, the need for digital training, digital yes. skills. So that's an interesting word, the uptake. Uh, mm -hmm. So how, how quickly people take up the need to um, adapt to the new, um, yeah. the, do, the new tool. So is VR a new tool or would you say it's uh, um, coming to I, age right now? I would say the current generation of VR headsets at the moment started off in 2014, 2015, when the first Oculus headset went okay. on the Kickstarter platform. Now that was funded, you know, quite generously, and then you know it was it was a, um, a, a, a the test kind of VR headset came out in 2015. So I mean we're talking about a relatively young industry. It's only within the last five years, but it's advanced extremely quickly. Okay. So we've gone from uh, uh, wired connected VR headsets. Now we're on to kind of like wireless headsets, like the Quest Two. So is this, and, is this um, part of a, a bigger setup, or do you buy that um, headset no, that, separately? That, this is the headset, and and you get two controllers with it, and and that's all it is. So it and is I the think, Oculus. Mm. Yeah, the, the Oculus Quest Two, and uh, the thing is, I think it's the accessibility because it's so easy. You don't need a computer and loads of cables and stuff. Mm. Um, and this has been one of the most successful, like within the last two years, it's outsold all the other VR headsets. Mm. So they realized that actually it was um, the, the, the kind of the key to um, the key to like uh, you know kind of the general public accepting this technology and using it more was actually accessibility. That's the key word. Okay. So the more accessible and easy it was to use, the more the people bought it and started using it. Basically, um, you can recognize uh, the gestures that you have to make, hold and yeah. uh, put on your head. Um, That's it. So, yeah. so we just to move into the uh, the unique advantage for um, uh, virtual um, gallery tours. Um, yeah. That's one thing. This this year, there's three clips that um, come to my mind, like. You've won the outstanding startup business of the year, and mm -hmm. you then went on to uh, national, well, re regional TV to um, um, show a virtual gallery that you've been part of uh, creating uh, hope, with Hope VR um, mm -hmm. as a response to restrictions for entering ga the gallery space physically. And you've also been doing 3D modeling. Um, for um, gallery exhibits like art modelization, so yeah, so I have a question uh, that I composed from one of the students. Uh, it's William. Um, yeah, and there's William um, asking, um, are you remaining in just art modelization, or might you um, adapt uh, into more doing monuments and architecture? Yeah, so I actually started off in architectural visualization. So um, I, I worked for an um, engineering consultancy for about 10 years. So uh, and I was doing research and development into VR and AR technologies in that field. So yeah, I, I think that um, I've actually uh, moved from architecture to the art modelization. Ah, so you, yeah. were, you were already involved in the VR yeah. modeling. Okay, ah. yeah, so already a VR modeling of architecture. Um, apartments, um, um, you know, doing interactive applications for kind of different engineering solutions and architectural solutions. And obviously we don't show a lot of that work because that was done in my kind of earlier yeah. career and, you know, that they belong to uh, other businesses. But yeah, our practice generally started off there. So yeah, and I, and I, I do see that um, there is, we're, we're getting asked to do a lot more sort of architectural projects now, uh, but it's more about, what you do in those environments rather than the actual yes. environment. So before it used to be about, oh, we want to be able to experience what this building might look like in the future. Mm. But um, now it's more like, oh, well, we need an office space so that we can conduct some uh, uh, experience in here. We need a inside of a, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, a high speed train so we can teach someone how to uh, you know, control the train yes. or put them into yeah. uh, a medical situation where they yeah. can kind of perform an operation and practice and learn. So, yeah, so it's kind of uh, evolving a lot now rather than it just being about the architecture. It's more about what can somebody do in that environment and, and, and you know, what, how, what can we teach them and yeah. what can we enable them to experience that is that is not that's quite difficult to um, 
replicate in real life. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, it's a safe way of um, um, uh, training uh, for complex procedures. Like um, there was one post that you uh, shared on LinkedIn, and I think mm-hmm. it was um, um, apprentices, like uh, m- mechanics apprentices or electricians, where yeah. they were using the ocular and the ocular VR uh, yeah. would replicate um the tools that were necessary so you'd have to learn which pressures to uh, apply and which tools were correct for the the right job and the vr could give you feedback yeah definitely yeah i mean i think um i think even like a a tutor or somebody could you can record those uh, training sequences and then play them back and kind of and any like you said yeah it's it's a safe place to test and the, the good the great thing about it is you can initiate any sort of um sequence of events so you can say you can do emergency situations um you know what if the pressure kind of went too high and we've even doing simulations with augmented reality as well for example on a boiler so how how would you safely you know refill the pressure on a boiler so we're talking so- about a boiler which is the the, the large uh water holder yeah and yeah that, so that- the the main heater for the for a house, yeah, mm. um, that heats the water, and it's like sometimes it needs maintenance or it needs instructions. So rather than doing paper based instructions, imagine an augmented reality based instruction. So you bring your phone up, and it's actually telling you to switch this ninety degrees yeah. to enable this, and and then to check the pressure. And when the point gets to the right place, then you know uh, this is where the pressure is correct, and it's kind of like giving that sort of visual feedback. Actually very tactile on on the actual object being able to augment the object with extra information mm-hmm. i think that's going to be very powerful you know going forward so is that is that one one area that you will move forward into the augmented reality definitely yeah we've been using augmented reality for museum experiences allow children to put okay. objects into the living room and then look at them we've also used it for like cars and other mm-hmm. objects as well mm-hmm. it's very good for design review as well where you want to share sort of a design and let people see it actual in space um but i see i see it kind of being used more and more for like um you know interaction with objects or augmenting an object so maybe if you went to a museum and you had a sort of a statue you could bring up your phone and get extra pieces of information you know uh, and it's all about just making uh, information more accessible for the mm-hmm. user really mm-hmm. giving them information in different ways and the way that we see it is it's just it's not something the technology isn't special in itself. It's the actual the way that you use it as a tool. So it's kind of like what, what you're going to do with it. So maybe that's the unique advantage. We talk about technology for the sake of technology. Mm-hmm. Like, um, yeah. uh, However, it's you've, you've found unique ways and you've discovered how businesses require what you do. Yeah. And uh, yeah. like the augmented reality uh, for housing situations, uh, housing builders can use that to to yeah. to uh not 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 for not for cost saving but for being more effective with energy consumptions maybe yeah definitely i mean we've we've done a couple of uh, simulations with stuff like that in terms of like imagine i mean I, I, one example is like if you were in one room and there was a certain type of glazing and how much heat loss you might get and you would be able to visualize that you know um obviously the, the initial cost of um you know um, the more efficient solution, obviously, it's going to be more expensive. But then, when you can visualize the costs over a long period of time and see how much saving get, you're getting, so while it might be like you know fifty thousand pounds more expensive, but if you're saving five thousand, you know five hundred thousand pounds over five years, mm-hmm. then you can immediately kind of see the the, the benefit of making that initial invest, investment. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and especially for people being able to experience buildings as well, because architecture is a lot about space, about the the feeling of that space. And sometimes with uh, 2D plans, it's very difficult to get a sense of that space or get a sense of, um, you know, the environment. Um, yeah. And so VR kind of lends itself really well to people being able to walk in and have a look around and get a sense of what it what it might be. And then, you know, being able to spark up that conversation. An interesting project we did um, at the beginning of COVID actually was there was a Canadian uh, fuel company who were redesigning the branding for all of their uh, fleet of trucks 
and you know they were getting finding it really hard to visualize you know what would the design look like what would these yeah. trucks look like if they were next to each other and do they all match and do they can you tell that they're from the same business at the same time yeah. and we were able to create sort of a real time you know visualizer for all of the trucks with all the different designs on so you could flip between all the trucks see them all next to each other yeah i was curious all... about that because i did see uh, sorry to, i did see this and i yeah. thought that's a graphic design project it's very yeah. it's the it's the it's the mm -hmm. uh the visual element of a and it's 2D it's static and I thought how does this relate to and they uh, the, to the VR and the AR and you've just explained it it was to yeah. visualize how it's going to be uh yeah. in real life how how would it look in real life how would it look in the daylight and what if you had them all next to each other and what if we change different designs how does it look from the back when the cars are going to be following wow. and you know, and and so, so it's quite a powerful tool. And the, the great thing about it was because it was real time, we were able to get on a Zoom call with stakeholders from America, Canada, the UK. And, you know, we could present in real time and people could say, oh, well, what does it look like with this design? And can we have a look at the other design? Can we look from this angle? And in real time, we were just able to like, OK, yeah, somebody wants to see the back. Somebody wants to see what the tires would look like in a different color. And, and and so in real time we were kind of like designing and making decisions so we were facilitating this so we were controlling it and just listening to the instructions and yeah. helping them to visualize and yeah. see it from different angles and they were able to get like you know they were able to get sign off you know you know very very fast because everyone was on this everyone had an idea of yeah we, we you know nobody was saying you know I, I can't imagine it or i can't you know i don't know if it's going to work mm -hmm. but they could see it in front of them and you know it's yeah. closest thing to having the real thing in front yeah. of you really so you mentioned the word sign off so somebody um uh, confirming that that we can uh pay for this service and also yeah. uh we we yeah. are it's successful result they've received um but, and that 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 comes on to vm's um uh question um like you've just explained a little bit there do you plan on selling your visualization services or pairing up with other businesses you really just uh explained that um, yeah but yeah no what do you think? definitely i think the collaboration is really important the collaboration part of it everything that we do is a collaboration with our clients so it's about first that relationship is really important us understanding what it is that they're trying to do and really like you know really understanding what their pain points are and what it is that they're trying to achieve and and then it's about us thinking about how, how can we help them do that job better how can we save them money how can we allow them to do it you know better and faster and you know just just you know um and and, and that also has a knock-on effect of saving money and getting that sign off earlier um so i think um yeah i, th I think yeah definitely this collaboration um this virtualized you know visualization services they're, they're gonna they're kind of growing and yes. where as as the case studies are coming in so as, whenever we work on a project we kind of create a case study out of it mm. and that's another example that we can take to people and i think it's been really useful in the sense that we can uh, so we did a visualization for an american company that was just doing kind of server slides yeah. and being able to model up the slides and show how they fit and why they're versatile and how they enable you to do cable management and maintenance um you know that was very useful for the company because they've got a new product out and they're trying to explain to people how to use it it's quite a technical item yeah and just within like a one minute video we were able to kind of show how it works and yeah. you know it's 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 always about it's it, i think every project is a collaboration you know it's got it's got to be really so you're collaborating with other um businesses alongside yeah so so for example for the truck company we were working with the wrap company to understand their materials and what they could and couldn't do and then we were working with the graphic design company who are coming up with the different designs and then we were having to work out which which parts of the truck so we would have to keep, create a sort of a map of the truck so that they could place the advertisements on and then we're working with the actual fuel company who are going to be paying for all of this and them seeing actually actually they were able to make the decisions after seeing the visualizations so um and yeah is, so yeah and is that where the consultancy comes in you can be uh the sense the cent, the pivot point for all these companies yeah. to come together that's correct yeah because a lot of them don't actually understand what it is they need so they don't always understand actually we think maybe there's a better way of doing this but can you kind of help us with it and that's where the consultancy comes in where we can come in and can say okay because you're trying to do this yeah uh, then this technique would work for you but this technique wouldn't um 
So for example, um, we sometimes we get a lot of our clients come to us and saying, oh, we want a VR experience. But then when I speak to them and I, I, I find out what it is they're trying to do, I actually think actually the VR experience won't actually hit all the points that you're trying to do. Uh, maybe um, a touch screen or maybe an online version that everyone, you know, making it more accessible um, would work better. But we're able to kind of advise them and we can tell them why that is the case. And, you know, so they've got more of a kind of like a, um, they've got more confidence in their decision making and then they can move forward, um, you know, with a lot of some of that, some of our customers who are a bit scared of the technology, we're able yeah. to kind of guide them and maybe do like a, a phase one experiment so if they don't want to make a massive investment and they're afraid of that then we can break it down into a phase one and then they can test and kind of see how did it do and so that's a very small kind of experiment that is rather than them doing a huge massive project and then realizing at the end it doesn't actually um do what we needed it to do so um yeah. those kind of things that's our consultancy side of things is there is mainly guiding our clients through uh or trying to kind of um yeah um, navigate the the sort of VR and AR sort of technology, you know, um, forest out there. Really, yeah. you, you you refer to it as a forest. It's uh, it's mm. dense and uh, it's yeah. full. Of, it's full of technical la lingo language. Yeah, but it seems like you've learned you've learned the art of communicating your your technology really succinctly and uh, uh, that people understand in the words that people understand. Communicating technology is also a key yeah. skill. Yeah. And I, and, and I think that's why we're kind of finding that um, the training side of things has really kind of kicked off for us because we're, we're quite good at kind of guiding people through and explaining things simply. And I think there's an old saying, I can't remember who says it, but if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, th I think. And um, I think you're a teacher as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah I am. Yeah. So I teach. Uh, I teach. Well, I was actually teaching today as well. I was teaching a Unity course today, so teaching students about creating environments in uh, real time. Mm. So being able to create an environment and walk around it, similar to that gallery experience that you mentioned earlier. Yes. So we're actually teaching people that, and we're running a boot camp in um, uh, in mid May as well. So we're teaching a 16 p 16 week VR AR boot camp um, for 32 uh, 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 black female students to get encourage more black females into the tech industry um the so boot, yes the, the boot camp uh usually sounds quite a brutal uh thing because it's yeah. related to military but uh yeah, yeah. will it will it be um uh, an immersive experience for them um like 24 hour sessions or will they have breaks um no i think it's going to be it's going to be like a three days a week and three hour sessions uh so it'd be about nine hours a week so it's kind of like a part sort of like a part-time-ish mm -hmm. course mm -hmm. but it's kind of like there we're gonna the reason it's called a boot camp is because it's 16 weeks and within 16 weeks we're gonna get you up to a certain level mm -hmm. you'll be able to prototype vr and ar projects wow. quite quite easily mm -hmm um so um yeah it's it's going to be uh, it's going to be guided learning self-guided learning with also a lot of sort of we're incorporating a lot of video and interactive materials in there and because it involves the vr as well we're trying to we, part of the project is uh, learning the software but then part of the boot camp is actually you doing what you want to do with the technology as yes. well because i think it's important for people to be interested in technology and make good use of it it's important for them to have um, have a stake in it, have their own interest in it, like in it. Mm -hmm. So, um, if somebody's interested in cars, they can they can use a VR experience for cars. If they're interested yeah. in architecture, mm -hmm. or if they're interested in outdoors, uh, you know, spaces, or they're interested in art galleries, or if they're interested in museums, and they can bring their own interest into it. And so, we do really see the technology as a tool, uh, rather than as you know, this is the technology and this is what you can do with it. Yeah. It's like you can go away with it um and, and especially creative people we, we encourage them to kind of come and you know take up the technology and come up with ideas because it is really an ideas game at the moment the technology is out there like you said it's been around for five years yeah anyone can get access to it but it's really about the ideas now mm. it's not really about the technology we don't need seminars about vr headsets and and and, and ar and stuff everyone yeah. knows what it is mm -hmm. we we need to start using it and coming up with good ideas and good mm -hmm. use cases and building, you know, businesses out of those use cases. And yeah. I think that's where the really exciting part of VR and AR is, mm -hmm. where you know, creative people are coming up with amazing ideas. Yeah, the use the use cases. So that you've had many, um, uh, you've given us many examples of the use cases there. 
and uh, yeah. it seems like Taran 3D is an enabler of uh, ideas, and the technology of your choice is the Ocular and uh, VR a and AR environments. Yeah. So you're an enabler of ideas through some technology, which is the key, really. Um, yeah. And um, so, could I just like ask about yourself? So your training, you said you've gone through 15 years of uh, training. Um, um, did you already know that you were going to be working in VR when you first touched uh, software? Um, so yeah, when I kind of left school, I didn't actually do that while at school. Um, I didn't really leave with any GCSEs or anything. So I didn't really know what I wanted to do really. I was one of those kind of lost teenagers and, but I used to really enjoy playing computer games and playing games and kind of, uh, technology. I really liked it. I really enjoyed it. And I especially liked the kind of, uh, the environments in, in games. Cause I just found them quite, you know, mm. fun. You know, the, the fantasy environments or historical environments, I really enjoyed walking around. And, you know, even though there was a game, I'd be looking at the architecture and looking ah. at the outdoor spaces. And that kind of got me interested in yeah. actually how are these things made. And then when I found some software, like and I'm, pr I'm pretty much self-taught as well, like in it from the beginning, um, I went to university much later. So I did a master's in computer aided design, but that was like, you know, much later on once I'd be working in the industry for 10 years. Um, and so, yeah, I, I started working with the software, learning about it and really getting interested in it. I also start, I also got an interest in traditional sculpting as well with clay because it's quite closely related to 3D modeling. And yeah, it just kind of all sparked from there. And I just found that I would just play around with it. And I, I think the emphasis for me is always, even when we're teaching is to get people to play with stuff. Yes. Like, can it have fun? Mm. and play with it and see you know experiment with it and just try yes. things and yeah remove remo remove the barriers of failure yeah. failure is a great thing but That's you just right, have yeah. to keep trying and exploring yeah. and i find that is yeah one of the barriers there is like oh i've got to make something and i've got to achieve something amazing and i was like no no you don't have to achieve anything just have fun and do fun stuff with it and see what it can do and just enjoy the process of learning and enjoy the process of making something and having fun with it and I find that you do the learning as like a byproduct of having fun. Like, and even with kids as well, especially when we work with kids uh, with game engines, we like kind of have a lot of fun and they're learning at the same time. And I think that if you're not enjoying it, you're not going to continue with it and you're not going to learn a lot about it. Mm. So, yeah. And you say you have a, a team of five now. Uh, what, what, yeah. what, 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 uh, which uh, titles uh, come to mind? What, what kind of like job titles well, are there? We've got a marketing consultant who deals with all of our kind of outward communication, as in, you know, any projects that we're working on, making sure people know the type of things that we do, you know, and that sort of, you know, brand awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, then we've got an education officer who's joined us quite recently. And this is due to obviously a lot of the courses and stuff. So she's a teacher with like 15 years experience That's teaching art. And so she's able to kind of like really frame our technology. And sometimes we go a bit crazy with the technology and she's like pulling us back and saying, no, this is how you need to structure your learning. And we've got a 3D artist who does a lot of our, you know, 3D artwork and modeling. So supports there, a lot of the assets. And we've got a CAD specialist who deals with a lot of our engineering clients. So he's able to take their um, computer aided design data and translate it across into VR and AR. Um, so yeah, I think that's everyone that I've covered. And we've also got like a project manager joining us. And with the Kickstart scheme, we're actually uh, employing uh, an, a developer. So somebody who can program in uh, VR environments. Okay, so and a, a developer, uh, which is actually key to the students uh, here uh, yeah. that I'm working with, like they are developers themselves, like coders, Excellent. programmers. Yeah. Uh, so it's, so all, we... it, it's, a, it's a relevant uh, job to be part yeah. of the VR industry. Yeah, definitely. So w w myself, I'm a I'm a developer as well. So even though I'm very focused on the creative and the visual and 3D side, I can also program in C Sharp in Unity. So I do a lot of my own prototyping and stuff. And we kind of encourage everyone to learn a bit of coding anyway. Like we will encourage everyone. So even our sort of uh, CAD designer and our 3D artist, they'll know how to prototype things. And we have got a developer as well who works with us um, and you know pro helps us to kind of like make sort of program systems and plug them in and usually we try to make like modular systems that we can reuse and repurpose again and again and that sort of stuff yeah well maybe um it's time to wrap up because that's such a rich uh window into what taron 3d uh, has achieved right now um 
so just like to say thanks and um, um, yeah, it's how could people stay in touch with you? What what where 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 would you send them to? Is it more LinkedIn or more the website uh, generally? Yeah, so we've just recently um, launched our website karen3d.com. But if you look on social media, LinkedIn is a good place to follow us. We kind of update that quite regularly. But we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as well. But yeah, just just do a search for Taron 3D in whichever platform you're on, and we're mainly kind of yeah on on most of the social media networks. Okay, well I'll just uh, stop the recording here. So a little smile from us both. Ha, ha, ha.